Everywhere in media, new models are emerging. The changes in the media industries are evidence of a broader change. There's growing evidence that we need to rethink and rebuild many of the organizations and institutions that have served us well for decades. But now we've come to the end of the, some of their life, life, life cycles. We're proud to welcome one of the world's leading thinkers on the impact of the digital revolution on business and society and expect him to help explain the new model of the enterprise and new drivers for competitiveness and success. He's a thought leader on the strategic value and impact of information technology and has authored or co-authored 14 widely read books, including the international bestseller, Wikonomics, and its successor, Macroeconomics, as well as Grown Up Digital. Just before Don comes on, we have a short video. Something you might not know about Canada. Hi, I'm Don Tapscott, and before the break, I promised to tell you about the digital office. In the 1970s, the coolest decade of all time, the office was full of strange things like typewriters, dictaphones, <coughs> adding machines, and mimeographs. Telephones were connected to a wire, so people could only reach you when you were in the office. God, I miss that. Not now! In 1978, the Canadian company Bell Northern Research wondered what would happen if every desk had a computer on it connected to a vast internetwork. Their incredibly handsome staff created an office that used crazy things like email, word processing, texting, and document management. Then BNR pitted the computerized workers against the computerless old school test group. This first ever controlled experiment proved that the digital workers were more efficient, innovative, and effective. And they had more fun, too. And within only 15 years, office workers across the globe were playing electronic solitaire and watching cat videos to their heart's content. And that's something you might not know about Canada. That seems like a long time ago. I wrote a book on that experience in 1981, and uh, arguing that computers were becoming communications tools. I think my mother bought most of the copies. Um, and the big reason that people said that this will never happen, that regular people will never use computers connected to a network, is, or was, you all will never learn to type. All these profundities were reduced to the question of typing efficiency. I became a typing evangelist. Um, anyway, the topic today is the enterprise. And in the next uh, 55 minutes, I'm going to try and convince you of the following idea. That the enterprise is going through the biggest change in its short history. And most of you work for an enterprise, pretty much all of you. A company, big or small, a government, a uh, NGO, civil society organization. And due to some big changes in technology, demographics, the economy, and society, this institution that we've chosen for the creation of, innova uh, uh, of wealth, for innovation, for, for the creation of products, services, and so on, is going through a very profound change. Now, that idea was introduced in Wikonomics in 2007. And we argued that the internet is not about hooking up online, creating a gardening community, websites, eyeballs, stickiness, clicks, page views, anything like that. It's a global computational platform. The internet's become a big computer. And every time you use it, you program it. And that's radically changing the deep structure and architecture of the enterprise. The way that we orchestrate capability is changing because talent can now be outside our boundaries, not just inside. Now, the book was a big book. It was actually the best-selling management book for the whole year in the United States. And then something happened. We saw the subprime crisis and the whole crash of the dot-coms, or of the, uh, the, the whole mortgage market. And really, the whole global economy came almost to a standstill. Who would have imagined five years ago that one of the big themes of business books and magazine articles and 
so on today would be how to save capitalism, or is capitalism even savable? And these books are not being written by Occupy types, they're being written by the capitalists. Do you know this guy Paul Krugman? Anybody here? He writes for the New York Times, Nobel Prize winning economist, controversial guy. For some reason I end up, or I have ended up speaking at the same event as him a few times recently. And he gets up and he says, look, when you have the crash of a financial system, you get a prolonged period of slump. Japan had one in 1992. They're still in a slump. He says, so get ready for a couple of decades of ugliness in the global economy. And that's the good news scenario because some really bad things can happen, like if Spain or Italy defaults on its sovereign debt and Angela Merkel and Germany don't backstop the euro, the euro collapses, Europe goes into a depression, which would lead the whole global economy into a depression. So I get up on the stage, I look out, this audience is all kind of like in a fetal uh, position, and I say, look, far be it from me to debate a Nobel Prize winning economist, but I have a different view. I think that the future is not something to be predicted, the future is something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future in the world than the one that he outlines. But if we're going to do that, we need to know what the problem is. And the problem today in the world doesn't fall within the paradigm or the mental model of traditional economists. We worry about things like the business cycle, you know, the debates in the US. Should we have more austerity and cutbacks? Should we should have more fiscal stimulation, as Krugman argues. I mean, these are good debates, but they're all within the old model. This is not a cyclical change that we're going through in the world today. It's a secular change. It's a sea change. It's a turning point in human history. Basically, if you look around today, all around the world, we have a, a set of institutions of the industrial age that are finally running out of gas. And everywhere, there are these institutions that have served us well for decades or even centuries that are at various stages of being stalled or frozen or in atrophy or even failing. And this is the topic of my uh, penultimate book. It's called Macroeconomics. And uh, I'm delighted to hear we're doing a book signing right after this session outside. But, and the way to buy that book is in massive volume. This is the way to Christmas. It's coming soon. You look like people with friends. No, seriously. I mean, these are 16 institutions where for every one, you see an institution that's failing contrasted by the contours, and we can see those contours, of a, of a set of sparkling new initiatives to reinvent this institution around a new communications medium and around a new set of principles. So upper left there, the Industrial Age Corporation, typified by General Motors, America's greatest company ever, it went bankrupt. The financial system, some of you may have seen because uh, it's up on uh, YouTube. If you go to the Google and ask it, it will tell you uh, where to find it. But um, I gave this talk. It was uh, one of the harder talks I've given in a long time. It was called TEDx Wall Street. It was at the New York Stock Exchange. And I was the opening speaker, and I stood up. And the room was packed, and there were people lined up around the edges. And, and you could hear a pin drop. And I said, Wall Street, we have a problem. There's a growing conception and understanding that the world is becoming less fair, less stable, less sustainable, less prosperous, and you're at the heart of this whole thing. Your core modus operandi almost brought down the global capitalist system. Have you changed? And of course they haven't. The newspaper, I mean the last newspaper will be published some in North America in sometime around the year 2025. I mean, it's an institution of the industrial age. It's how we inform ourselves in an industrial way. The industrial age was an age of mass production, where something in the center controlled something and they pushed it out to passive recipients. The industrial age was an age of scale and an age of standardization. 
And, but as one youngster said to us, if the news is important, it will find me. Now, there are all kinds of tough issues with all of these. I mean, the newspaper, how do we inform ourselves in an age where the old ways of doing that are collapsing? How do we, how do we pay journalists? How do we get good reporting? How do we get investigative reporting? CNN just killed all its investigative reporters. Uh, reporting. How do we... How do we prevent this balkanization where we can all follow our own point of view and where maybe the purpose of, of information is not to inform us, but it's to, to give us comfort? We're all in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers. These are all tough issues. The nation state and global problem solving, you know, all these big problems in the world, they're not getting better, most of them. Are they just too hard to solve? Or is our model wrong? Our model came out of Bretton Woods at the end of the Second World War. And we created all these global institutions based on nation states. The, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, the GATT, the WTO, the UNESCO, the International Standards Organization, then the G8, the G20, they can't seem to get things done. Now, meanwhile, there are millions of people using the internet just to self-organize to solve problems in the world. So I could go through all of these. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the upper left one today, fundamentally, but uh, each one is kind of like a one hour talk. I mean, if you guys are up for it, I'll, I'll, we, 16 hours, what do you say? We can, Fidel Castro can do it. No, seriously. Um, I'll just take one more. Education. We have the very best model of pedagogy that 17th century technology can provide. Now, it's a good model compared to what existed before, but it's all about something in the center pushing out something to passive recipients. Mass production, mass media, mass marketing. You know, you're pushing out products, you're pushing out television shows, you're pushing out advertisements, you're pushing out lectures. I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't get ready, here it comes. You know, and your goal is to take it into short-term active working memory and through practice and repetition to build deeper cognitive structures so you can recall it to me when I test you. Drill and kill. Sage on the stage. The lecture is, is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student without going through the brains of either. Now, I appreciate the irony that I'm standing up here giving you a lecture. Um, <laughs> But this is actually not a good way of learning. I'm just trying to convince you of a single idea. But none of you are going to remember the 16 institutions or the seven new business models or the five principles that I'm about to tell you. So for every one of these failing institutions, we can see a new model emerging. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let me just, before we get into this, I'm going to take you back even uh, a little further. All around the world, hundreds of years ago, we had an agrarian economy, and the means of production and political system was called feudalism. There were no enterprises. And knowledge was tightly concentrated in tiny oligopolies of the church and the state. People didn't know about things. There was no concept of progress. You were just born, you lived your life, and you died. And then along comes Johannes Gutenberg with his great invention. And over time, different parts of the society began to acquire knowledge. And when they did, the institutions of feudal agrarian society started to appear to be stalled, or frozen, or an atrophy, or even failing it. It didn't make sense for the church to be responsible for medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. So we had the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. We saw the creation of parliamentary democracy, the nation state. I, a couple of weeks ago, I was in India for two weeks. And I was reminded India wasn't a nation state until 1947, and it wasn't the India it is today until 1961, when, when Goa became part of India. It was a Portuguese colony. Italy wasn't a nation state until 140 years ago. But this was all good. We saw the creation of science, the university, and the corporation commercial relationships. And eventually, this led to the Industrial Age, and it advanced our standard of living but it did come with a cost. 
And now, once again, the technology genie is out of the bottle. Only this time, it's very different. The internet, sorry, the printing press gave us access to the written word. The internet enables each of you to be a publisher. The, 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 the printing press gave us access to recorded knowledge. The internet, sure, gives us access to knowledge. You can go to the Google and ask it, but it gives us something much more important. It gives us access to the intelligence contained in the crania of other people on a global basis. This is not an information age. It's an age of networked intelligence. It's an age of collaboration. And it's an age where people can participate in the economy and in social life in ways that were previously unthinkable. So let's bring it down to earth a bit. Why is all this happening? Well, four big drivers for change. The first is a technology revolution. You've got lots of great people here talking about this, so I won't spend much time on that. But the new social web, this ain't your daddy's internet. The first thing is, uh, I was just in Texas <laughs> speaking, sorry. Um, yo. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have my boots on. But um, first of all, we access the internet through the thing. Billions and trillions of inert objects that become smart communicating devices. Um, if you're staying at this hotel, the door, the Marriott, because they have upscale um, IT, the door has a chip in it, it's interconnected, and the door has an IP address. The door knows about you. I had a camera stolen from a hotel in Miami a few years ago, and the door had knowledge. It knew who'd been in and out of the room. And we actually found an unauthorized access. I have a friend in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address, and all these things are connected to each other, and they, they talk to each other. I have no idea what his refrigerator says to his toaster, but um, he was actually bragging that his fence talks to his sprinkler system. And I said, well, Ken, why would you care? He says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so this is pervasive ambient computing. Now, this is about a year ago. Who here has a square? OK. You should all go get one. I'll tell you my square story. It was about a year ago. I was at the Standard Hotel in New York. I'm meeting these two young women in their early 20s. They've created this fabulous NGO called Digital Democracy. And they wanted to meet me because they created it after having read Macroeconomics. And they brought along copies of the book for me to sign. So here's this little startup, Social Innovators. I felt bad that they'd gone and paid 30 bucks or something for a book. So I said, you know what? I'm going to buy the three founders. I'm going to buy three copies of the book, $100. And I reached in my pocket, and I realized I didn't have any cash. And so the woman says, well, I have a square. And I'm, you have a square? What's a square? And uh, she pulls this thing out, pops it into the audio thing on her iPhone. I give her my credit card. She slices it through. $100 I sign. 10 seconds later on my mobile, I've got a receipt, including a tax receipt. She is a full functioning point of sale retail operation in her purse. I was thinking, I got to get one of these squares. So I go down to the Apple store. I'm thinking this would be a few hundred bucks to turn yourself into a store. And uh, $9.95, sir, $9.95, but you get it back as soon as you've used it uh, a, a few times. So this is pervasive computing. The physical world is becoming smart. Then we have the rise of broadband mobility. Remember dial-up? This is being brought to you by some interesting players like Google that's driving a lot of this. The old web, you surfed websites. The new web, you surf physical reality. So you take your little mobile device, and you're in London, and and um, it's a video camera, but as you're looking around at, um, uh, say, uh, Trafalgar Square, it's annotating what's happening. What do you want? The history layer. This is like layer, L-A-Y-A-R, or Google goggles. Um, this is the intersection of the physical and, and, uh, and digital world, and that's a big change. The old web is data, text, voice, and image. The, the new web is true multimedia. This is not a photograph. This is a real-time animation. So there's this thing called the Berlin Alley keynote of the Berlin Film Festival. And I, I did it. Um, 
uh, a while back, and I talked about the film 2.0, because the idea of a, a movie, it's been around for 100 years, the full-length feature film it, is the narrative, right? It's got a beginning, it's got an end, it's got a plot, it's got characters, but now you can be in the movie. Now, personally, I don't want to be in the movie, but my kids do. Um, I have yet to give a talk as a hologram, but I was introduced by the CEO of a company. He was right there, and uh, he was a hologram, <laughs> and he introduced me. Um, this is a, a famous concert that happened at uh, Coachella, where uh, Tupac um, and uh, Snoop Dogg uh, did a thing together. The thing, uh, the thing about, that's amazing about this is Tupac had been killed uh, 10 years uh, earlier, but they did a rap thing together. So this is true multimedia. We have the rise of web services. So every time that you go on the internet, you upload something, you, you, you uh, remix something, you uh, uh, put something on Pinterest or, or, or whatever, you are programming this giant global computer. Humanity is building a machine that we all share. And this is a profound enabler of change. And the final thing, for those of you, and I know many of you care about IT within your own organization, there's a big change happening in the enterprise. Back in the day, a decade ago, the internet was separate from real IT. You're here from a bank, and I know a number of you are. You had your real banking systems, but they had nothing to do with the internet. The only way these came together was around the intranet, and it was very tenuous. Well, now, um, these things are actually coming together because you can move your IT onto this big global computer called the internet. And when you do that, you get lower cost, you get better integration. The best thing is the world becomes your software development department. So now this, this is not easy because all of you have this little detail called the legacy, right? And I know some of you in this room have systems that are old enough to vote and drink. And, um, so how do you create the conditions whereby new investments contribute to a desired future as opposed to perpetuating the past? The way I've been describing this now for some time is that God may have created the world in six days, but he didn't have an installed base. Now, because we're in Toronto, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story, and a couple of people in the room can verify this. I was giving a talk in Toronto, and behind the screen was a big window. It was an office tower. And um, unbeknownst to me, a thunderstorm was shaping up outside. And I confess I used that joke before. And I said, dutifully, God may have created the world in six days, but he didn't have an installed base. Just as I said that, I kid you not, a bolt of lightning cracked across the window. Everyone could see it. The whole room instantly shook with thunder. And everyone's like, what's that? And then, of course, they... They all kind of burst into laughter, relieved. But my <laughs> regret was that we didn't capture it on video because I could have put it up onto YouTube. You know, Tops guy gets endorsement for big idea uh, <laughs> from powerful sources. So for you IT types, this is a big opportunity. It's not easy, but it's an historic opportunity. So that's number one. Number two is, this technological revolution is intersecting with a demographic revolution. Who here is under the age of 33? Would you put up your hands? Wow, what a great, that's awesome. Who here has kids under the age of 33? Okay, so that's a lot of the people in this room, which is excellent. Um, and it's good that you people are having kids. I was in Italy recently, I said, who's having, who has kids under the age of 33? And like three hands went up. I, don't, I, I I kid you not, I almost said, you know what, let's just kill this lecture. Go home, light a candle, put on some nice music, get a bottle of wine, make some babies. <laughs> this is a huge problem in Western Europe. It's worse than Japan, where they have no young people and a restrictive immigration policy. Anyway, I started studying kids about 20 years ago now, when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all this sophisticated technology. At first I thought, my children are prodigies. And, um, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with about 300 kids. I wrote this book back in 97, and then I wrote the, the sequel um, recently. 
uh, because they're not just growing up digital, they're, they've grown up. They're coming into the workforce, into the marketplace, into society, and there's no more powerful force to change every institution. Why should we care? Well, first of all, in Canada, and in <laughs> North America, and South America, and most of Asia, um, they're the biggest generation ever. People call them the boomlets. Well, that's a bad term. The echo is louder than the boom. There are eight million of them in Canada, born between 1978 and 1997. This is the baby boom echo. There are only 7.8 million baby boomers. So based on their demographic muscle alone, these kids are gonna dominate the 21st century. But what makes them a real force for change is that this is the first generation to come of age in the digital age, they're different. Now this is a cartoon from Growing Up Digital in 1997. It didn't even get a chuckle in this room. Back then, if I put this cartoon on the slide, people would be falling off their chairs, they'd be laughing so hard. Everyone looks at it today like, what's that weird thing? I mean, how come he doesn't have a tablet or something? <laughs> but um, lots to talk about, and I'm gonna be around for most of the morning, happy to discuss this. We did a $4 million research project, interviewed 11,000 young people in 10 countries, Time online is not taken away from hanging out with your friends, learning the piano, talking to your parents, or doing your homework. Time online is taken away from television. The boomers watch 24 hours a week of TV per kid. These kids watch less TV and they watch it differently. They come home, they turn on their computer, they're in three different windows, and they got three magazines open, they're listening to iTunes, and talking on the phone, maybe more likely texting, they got a video game, go oh yeah, and they're doing their homework. And the television may be going on in the background, but the TV's kind of like ambient media, right? It's like Muzak. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipients of somebody else's video, like my generation was, they're reading and organizing and composing their thoughts and telling their stories and remembering things and scrutinizing and so on. This is changing the brains of an entire generation. Overall, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now, this is, uh, I got a, uh, some Toronto stories here, so I'll just uh, tell you this. This is back in 2006, the World Congress on IT. And it uh, just happened actually in Canada, um, in Montreal, the first time it was ever held in Canada. And I was uh, delighted to chair the thing. But, but back then, I, I did this panel. And um, on the left, out of the mouths of babes, on the left there is Rahaf Harfouche. Does anyone here know Rahaf or know of Rahaf? She, uh, she was about 20 at the time. She was studying in Paris, her boyfriend was in Toronto, so they turned on video Skype all day long to keep their relationship going. They cooked together across the ocean and stuff like that. So I asked her, Rahaf, your generation, do you use email? She says, oh no, Mr. Tapp's got email is yesterday's technology. I said, well, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email is sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email. Um, Two down from her is Sherry Kong, 20-year-old student in New Zealand, hired with 80 other students by the government. Their job? To teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. I asked her, so Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Tapp's got the teachers, they're awful, they talk in class, they don't do their homework. <laughs> um, and beside her is Michael Furtick, he's the granddaddy of them all. I've known Michael since he was 13 when he was the project manager on my website here in Toronto, he was on, on growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager as a 13 year old because he was the oldest. And um, when Michael was 15, his own site was getting 20 million page views a month. Um, and he sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight figure sum. The Globe wrote a story uh, saying he probably only got a million dollars. And I wrote him an email, I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars, you should have called me. And he wrote back and he said, Don, legally I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can't tell you I'm very happy. And uh, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, although he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around with him because he had his learner's permit. Um, he wanted the money to invest in his next new venture. Check it out, it's called Taking It Global, one word, dot org. Um, hundreds of thousands of young people on a social network Kids want to change the world. So if you're building an enterprise, or a marketing system, or for that matter, a school, or a science,
program or a government or a model of democracy. These are the eight norms of the generation, really briefly. I want freedom. Choices like oxygen. Uh, I had three media choices when I was a kid. Today, young people have millions. They want to customize everything. I never got to customize the Mickey Mouse Club when I was a kid. They're a generation of scrutinizers. When I was a kid, I saw a picture. It was a picture. Very strong values. Just not true that they don't give a damn. We've created a little army of narcissists, says Gene Twang in uh, Generation Me. Well, actually, youth volunteering is up year over year for 15 years in both university and high school. Generation of collaborators. I grew up being a passive recipient. They like to have fun. Not like work should be a party, but they think work, learning, collaborating, and having fun are all the same thing. Not my generation. It was a period in your day where you worked, and then you went home, and you had a martini or something, and that was fun. Oh, or better, there's a period in your life where you work, and then you retire, and then you get to have fun if you don't have a stroke or something. Um, a generation that wants speed, oh, immediate gratification. No, they just have legitimate expectations that things should move faster and a generation of innovators. Now, you put those two together and you get a social revolution. It's not just that there are a billion people on Facebook. Social media is becoming social production. This is not about hooking up online. It's a new means of production that's in the making. And I'm just going to tell you one uh, story here because I want to get right to the point. Um, it was about five years ago now, uh, a friend sent me an email saying, you know this guy, senator from Illinois, Obama, he thinks that he's trying to win the Democratic nomination. He thinks that your book is the key to winning the presidency and transforming America. Go to mybarackobama.com. So I went there, and there's Wikinomics on the screen. I'm like, wow. We believe in dynamic partnering, transparency, use of the internet every way possible. For those who believe in, in, um, in the book Wikonomics by Don Tapscott, and he's saying, I'm asking you to believe not just in my ability to bring about real change in Washington, I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I looked at this thing, and well, my first reaction was, I am the man. <laughs> But not so fast, Don, because it turns out I'm not the man. Because, um, yeah, there was a Wikonomics community, but I started looking around. There was also a Young Firefighters for Obama community. There was a Single Moms for Daycare for Obama community. He created a platform whereby 35,000 communities self-organized. And that's what brought them to power. These communities each had a target. They raised over $100 million. So, Self-organization, it's been around throughout human history, but what used to take place over millennia or years, language was a function of self-organization, can now happen very fast. And we'll come back to this, because this is key. It can also lead to big change in society. There was a big debate about the role of the internet in social change, um, and I, I participated in that debate, and it was a good discussion. Then it got settled by one word, Tunisia, and then it had some other words, Bahrain, Egypt, on and on. The Tunisian revolution wasn't caused by social media, it was caused by injustice. It wasn't uh, created by social media, it was created by a new generation that, of young people that wanted hope and who, who didn't want to be treated as subjects anymore. But <laughs> the media, was key to this whole thing happening in ways that people don't understand. During the Tunisian Revolution, snipers were killing unarmed students in the street. So the kids would take their mobile devices, take a picture, triangulate the location of the sniper, send that to friendly military units, because the military was split, a pre-revolutionary situation, and the friendly units would come in and take out the sniper. You think that social media is about hooking up online? For these kids, it was a tool of self-defense. Up until a year ago, when there were big demonstrations in Syria, now it's totally disintegrated, but if you were injured on a street, an ambulance would come in a demonstration, an ambulance would come and pick you up, take you to the hospital, you'd go in with a broken leg, say, and you'd come out with a bullet in your head. The regime was killing people, injured people. So these two youngsters in their 20s took Twitter, created an alternative emergency healthcare system where you got injured, 
Tweets go out, you get picked up, you get taken to a makeshift medical clinic where you get medical care as opposed to being executed. So, of course, there are lots of problems with this, and we can talk about this. Up until three years ago, all revolutions in human history had a leadership and an organization, and when the old regime fell, the new leadership took power. Well, these wiki revolutions happened so fast and so virally and so rapidly that they create a vacuum, and politics abhors a vacuum. So, of course, the vacuum, vacuums get filled by organizations. The big threat is the old regimes come back, or um, you know, fundamentalist uh, uh, type forces that are not trying to create a secular society. But you know something? The arc of history is a positive one. And this is moving forward. And the train has left the station. The horse has left the barn. The toothpaste is out of the tube. Help me out here. The, um, so you put those together and you get to our topic today, which is an economic revolution. Throughout the, most of industrial capitalism, until recently, the enterprise was a vertically integrated organization. It did everything from soup to nuts. And about 75 years ago, a Nobel Prize winning economist named Ronald Coase asked a deceptively simple question. He said, well, why does this enterprise exist? He said, if Adam Smith is right, the open market's the best mechanism for determining how goods and resources and people or information are allocated. Why, why do we have enterprises? Why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? And he said, the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying this, the answer is transaction costs. Now, the way he defined that was the cost of collaboration. He said, the cost of of search, this is 75 years ago, of search in an open market, of trying to find the right people to do something, or the right materials, or the right you know, information, be totally prohibitive. So we bring that inside the boundaries of a firm, where you have things like filing cabinets to find information, and org charts to find people. Transaction costs are lower inside the boundaries of the firm, and that's why Henry Ford had within his boundaries a, a power plant, a shipping company, a glass factory, a steel mill, because the cost of collaboration in an open market was greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of a corporation. Now, 20 years ago, some of you know, I wrote a book called Paradigm Shift, where I said, whoa, just a second. I think the boundaries of this corporation are becoming more porous through things like information technology and facsimile and, uh, and modern transportation. We called it the extended enterprise. Then along comes the internet. Transaction costs in an open market dropped even further and vertically integrated companies began to unbundle into focus companies that work within networks. Cisco figured that out. Nortel did not. And the difference was huge. A business model conferred, now Nortel made some other mistakes, but a business model conferred competitive advantage to Cisco. And now, <laughs> transaction costs are dropping so much that peers can come together and create value. You're a bunch of peers, mainly in this room, right? The way we've created value in the past was through superiors and subordinates. Peers can come together and they can create value within a company peers in the sense of companies acting as peers, and the crazy one is peers outside the boundaries of traditional companies. So if you can create an encyclopedia with a million people they've never met, it's in 240 languages, the quality is as good as Britannica, according to the big study that's been done, what else could you create <laughs> through peer production? Could you create a computer operating system? Well, you all know the Linux operating system is owned by no one, it's in a commons and it's peer produced. Linux is now the dominant operating system in the world. For medium and large computers, it dominates, now it dominates mobile devices. And a while ago, Linux announced a big new customer, China. Imagine that. You're the salesperson on the Asia account. Hey, boss, I got a new customer. China. Lot of users, lot of users. Seriously. Could you create a physical good? Well, the Chinese motorcycle industry has dozens of little companies. 
They all cooperate together. They meet in tea houses and on the internet. There's no OEM, there's no Harley Davidson pulling all the strings. This is now 40% of global motorcycle production and get ready for the $1,000 car using the same model. So these are huge drivers, tectonic drivers for change, and you throw in the economic crisis. We now have a burning platform. I've been talking about changing the enterprise for a long time. We now have to do it. You know the idea of a burning platform, that you're somewhere where the costs of staying where you are become significantly greater than the costs of going to something new, even though that new state may be radically different and may be unknown. We have to change all of those 16 institutions if we're to move forward as a civilization. So let me try and pull this together for you and talk about five principles for rebuilding the enterprise for the 21st century and for a new age. Collaboration, openness, sharing, interdependence, and integrity. First on collaboration. Now when I say that, I'm not talking about a bunch of people sitting in a room having a nice meeting. I'm talking about collaboration that can occur on an astronomical scale. Who knows the story of Rob McEwen and Goldcorp? Anybody? Wow. It's just the, it's just the trouble with my life. I think everyone has heard everything. <laughs> no one has heard hardly any of these things. Well, I'm, I get to tell you this story. Um, and the reason I know this story is because this guy, Rob McEwen, is my neighbor in Toronto. He moved across the street from me, and he held a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And um, he says, you're Don Tapp's got to read some of your books. And I said, great. I, I, I said, what do you do? And he says, well, I used to be a banker, and now I'm a gold miner. And he, he introduces his wife to the group. He's a funny guy. He says, this is my wife. She's a gold digger. Um, <laughs> Thankfully, she is not. She's an enormously competent person, entrepreneur, and so on. But anyway, he tells me this amazing story. He takes over this gold mine, and his geologist can't tell him where the gold is. He gives them millions more dollars to get more geological data. They can't tell him where to go into production. After a few years, he's so frustrated, he's ready to give up. But then he has an epiphany one day. He wonders, if my geologists don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he does a radical thing. He takes his geological data, biggest secret in the mining industry, kept in safes and high security computer systems. He takes his data, he publishes it, and he holds a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It's basically $500,000 in prize money for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? He gets 77 submissions from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of. And for his half a million dollars in prize money, my neighbor finds $3.4 billion worth of gold. The market value of his company goes from $90 million to $10 billion. Um, uh, we were just vacationing with Rob and Cheryl on their beautiful private jet in France. And he tells me the market value of Gold Corp today is $36 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. <laughs> he peered. You know, conventional wisdom is that talent is inside, right? Your most precious asset goes out the elevator every night. You, everybody's heard that, right? Well, Rob McEwen's most precious assets that found this gold we're not anywhere near his elevator. They were in Asia. He peered. Conventional wisdom is, uh, I guess he should have fired his geology department. No, he wondered who are their peers. <laughs> Many of his submissions didn't come from geologists. They came from computer science companies, engineers. <laughs> he had chemists giving organic solutions to the, this non-organic problem. And the winner was a computer graphics company that built a three-dimensional model of the mine, where you can helicopter around underground and see where the gold is. So he helped us understand that the architecture of how we orchestrate capability for the enterprise is beginning to change. Now, another big part of collaboration is that we have this view that customers, well, they're outside, right? We have customer centricity. We focus on our customers who are out there. Well, you know what? 
don't focus on your customers. Engage them. Don't have customer centricity. Have customer innovation. Think of your customers as being inside your business web, inside your business network. Now, because this is tied in with Canadian Music Week, I thought I'd give a, a musical example, because the music industry has been the poster child on how to do this wrong. So um, someone takes Jay-Z's Black Album, the Beatles' White Album, remixes them together. They are now engaged. It creates the Gray Album. Sales of the White Album go up. Sales of the Black Album go up. The record industry should be singing hallelujah. Instead, they sue the guy. Now, this is a big uh, problem. And I'm going to come back to it in a sec. But the idea here is prosumers. That's our term that we've been using for a long time, is you turn your customers into producers. Threadless is a clothing company where all of their designs are created by their customers. Very profitable because they never sell anything until there's a big enough market for it. Last time I checked, they had like 70 million in revenue and 11 employees. Do you know about the Doritos crash, the Super Bowl contest? Anybody? Doritos said to its customers, we want to engage you not just in creation of our products, but in our, in our own advertising. We would like you to create our ads for us. We're going to have a contest. And the winners get to run on the Super Bowl. I'm going to show you a couple of them now. This ad ran on the Super Bowl. It was created by a couple of nobodies, young women. They're now not nobodies. They're stars in the advertising industry. Could we run that video? Paper or plastic? Paper's fine. I like these. Oh, nacho cheese. Old school. Fiery habanero? Yeah! Those are hot! Huh? Oh, salsa verde. Oh! <laughs> Blazing buffalo and ranch? Giddy up! Gonna need a clean up on register six. So, some of these ads, you can imagine, were a little edgy and never got onto the Super Bowl. But one of the more edgy ones did, and I'm gonna, it's one of my favorites, so I'll play it for you now. I mean, what ad agency is going to dress somebody up in a mouse suit and have them beat up your customer? But apparently for the Doritos demographic, it works really fine. Now, a next part about um, collaboration is internal collaboration. If electronic mail is a great technology for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents, how do we get beyond that and apply these new industrial, industrial strength social networks to internal collaboration? So um, this is an example of one. It's called um, Moxie Software Spaces. Full disclosure, I'm an investor uh, in this company. But every vendor is now coming out with this, including Google. Google Apps is, is getting beyond Gmail, trying to create a whole series of apps. These are the new operating system for the 21st century enterprise. Now, the second theme is openness. And I'm going to use a meaning of openness here that's very specific, and that's transparency. Now, most people think about WikiLeaks when they think about transparency, but I mean, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Basically, what's happening is that transparency is a powerful new force because people at their fingertips have the most powerful tool ever for finding out what's going on, informing others, and even organizing collective uh, responses. Now, this is a book, uh, book I wrote a, a decade ago, a Torontonian named David Tickle. And um, it was a very good book. It was uh, very badly timed. But uh, flash forward to today, this is my new book. It's a TED book. And you get it online at TED.com or on Amazon or uh, whatever. The book uh, just came out. And it has better timing. <laughs> um, but the idea is that, in fact, um, TED Global, its whole uh, 
the, the, one of the two major international TED conferences, the entire theme was called Radical Openness. And they asked me um, to, uh, to give the opening talk to that. So this is an idea whose time has come. Companies, enterprises are becoming naked. And if you're going to be naked, there are some corollaries that flow from that. One is that fitness is no longer optional. Or if you're going to be naked, you've got to get buff. Now, what that means is that you need to have value, because value is evidence like never before. You say you have the best product, services, they better be the best, because people can find out. But you also need to have values. You need to have integrity as part of your bones. And if you are buff, transparency is a wonderful thing. It drops transaction costs with all these different categories of stakeholders. It builds trust. It um, reduces, internally, reduces politics and game playing and so on. You get better innovation. You, you know this book, Dress for Success? You can undress for success. By opening the kimono, all kinds of good things happen. Now, the third theme is sharing. This is different than transparency. Transparency is about you as an enterprise communicating pertinent information to those different groups of stakeholders. Sharing is about giving up assets, the release of actual assets. Now, why would you do that? Well, the record industry, again, is, a, is the poster child. The, the idea throughout industrial capitalism was we do innovation, we create intellectual property, we own it, someone tries to infringe it, we get out our lawyers and sue them. So that's how the record industry responded to the challenge of the internet. But, but they took a legal solution to what was a business model disruption. And that was a mistake. See, all they had to do, all they had to do was, and, and this was clear a decade ago, all they had to do was turn music from being a product into a service. Everybody here will pay $4 a month for any song ever recorded stream to you on your mobile device, into your car, your home stereo, your television, your office, whatever, streaming audio with all kinds of services like, um, like uh, you know, give me Don's dinner party number three or Don's, you know, slow dance list or, or whatever. No one will steal music. Steal music. Why would you take possession of the song if you can listen to any song at any time in any kind of playlist or configuration? Does anyone here steal YouTube videos? You know, who streams YouTube videos as opposed to downloading your YouTube videos? You don't take possession of the video and you wouldn't take possession of the song. The whole issue of intellectual property goes away. But instead, the record industry took a legal response and the industry that brought you Elvis and the Beatles is now generally not liked by its customers and it's in macroeconomics, an industry insider told us that the third largest stream of revenue for the U.S. labels is suing people. This is pathetic. Now, IBM took a very different approach with Linux. It was confronted with the same thing. Companies competed on the basis of their operating systems, computer companies. And along comes a free operating system. What do you do with that? IBM embraced it. They gave away $400 million to the Linux community. Why would they do that? They saved themselves a billion dollars a year developing their own proprietary operating system. They created a platform upon which they built a multi-billion dollar business, and they also got to stick it to Microsoft, keep Microsoft out of the high-end computing market. It's probably not in that order of importance. So Nike's given away 400 patents into the green exchange, patents having to do with sustainability on the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats. The pharmaceutical industry, as we speak, is falling off the patent cliff. That's what it's called. They're losing a quarter of their revenue this year. So what do you do, cut back on paper clips? A quarter of your revenue as these blockbuster drugs go generic? No, they need to change their whole business model and start sharing a lot of the work that they do. And the big thing they should share is clinical trial data. They should place research for clinical trials into a commons, create a Linux of clinical trial data. And this is what 
uh, Andrew Witte, CEO of GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, is doing. They're just doing it, and the rest of the industry will do it too. It's an interesting issue for you. Increasingly, it's hard to reinvent the enterprise without changing your industry as well. Now, the fourth theme is interdependence. Business can't succeed in a world that's failing. And we have these four pillars of society that need to work together. Um, there's the state, there's the private sector, there's the civil society, this is taking it global, and there's a new fourth pillar, you, the individual. Um, you can be a pillar of society. So two 20-somethings in Boston go onto the Ushahidi network during the Haitian earthquake. They find a seven-year-old girl buried for four days under the rubble of a shopping center. She's dying, but she gets a little text out in Creole. They pick it up. They translate it, triangulate her location, advise the authorities. The girl's life is saved. Two youngsters in Boston were pillars of society helping solve a global problem because Haiti, uh, Haiti in the earthquake was a global uh, problem. So these pillars need to work together. But you know, I travel around and people say, ah, the best government is no government. Well, you know, after the subprime mess in the US where the, some banks disappeared, it was just a disaster. Uh, I was talking to Gordon Nixon, who's the head of RBC here. And I said, well, you must be pretty proud of yourself because the Canadian banks avoided all this. And he said, not really. He said, the structure of the mortgage market's different in Canada. Because of regulation, the Canadian banks are kicking it. This is not like government prevents business from being successful. A good regulatory environment enabled the Canadian banks RBC went from number 22 to number five in North America. And this is the list, the last list, of the safest banks in North America. The top six are Canadian. So all of this battling and warring between these four pillars of society, we need to find ways for them to work together. And the final theme is integrity. You know, integrity has a number of variables. It's about being honest. It's about caring being considerate of the interests of others. I'm a contractor, I'm trying to sell you something and work with you. It's not just about me and my profit. I actually care about you and your success. And it's about abiding by commi your commitments, about being accountable. And along with transparency, this is the foundation of trust. What is trust for an enterprise? Now, trust to me, I think I can say it in a sentence. Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity and transparency. That they will be honest, considerate of my interests, abide by their commitments, and they're going to be open. You know the expression, what are they hiding, shows the relationship between transparency and trust. So these are five principles for a new, um, a new model of the enterprise. This is a big change that's underway. Huge drivers, tectonic drivers, leading to fundamental changes in 16 institutions, and you're at the heart of it. So how's your enterprise going to find leadership for change? Well, this is the happiest part. We studied thousands of enterprises over the years. Do you know where leadership comes from? It could come from anywhere. Sometimes the CEO or the minister, or deputy minister, or head of state, or well, that one's rare, um, but uh, by a business unit manager, a marketing executive, a CIO, a programmer, an outside partner. We documented a story where in Toronto where a secretary was the key person in the transformation of a division of one of the biggest banks. And she had what it took to be a leader. She willed it. The, Leadership, the old model was Lee Iacocca, you know, or Jack Welch or something. Great visionary, sell a vision down. The person at the top can't learn for the organization as a whole anymore. Things are getting too complicated. And that's not my idea. That's Peter Senge from a book 20 years ago called The Fifth Discipline. So that means that leadership is each of our personal opportunity if we will it. Let me end, if I could by saying, uh, we're at a turning point here. Door number one, door number two. 
And if we take door number one, the future will be a bleak one. There's another route that we can take. I'll end with a video describing the new model of the enterprise. If we could just turn that music down a bit, that would be great. Uh, recently, I've been studying nature to try and understand these new models. And fish come in schools, um, bees come in uh, swarms and hives. Starlings over the moors of England in the cold winter months come in something called a murmuration. Murmuration refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. And throughout the day, the starlings are out over a 20 mile radius, sort of doing their starling thing, uh, foraging for food and so on. And at night they come together and they create thousands and thousands of them, create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. The murmuration has a function. See on the right, there's a hawk, a predator, being chased away by the collective power of the birds. It's not just for show, it protects the birds. It warms them up for the cold night ahead. Scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, is this some kind of uh, fanciful analogy? Or could we actually learn something from this? Well, you know what? This thing functions according to those five principles I just described to you. It's a massive collaboration. There's a huge openness and there's all kinds of rules that govern how this works. The big one is don't bump into anybody else. Um, but there's a great science that talks about all, all the, the, the dynamics of this resilient sort of changing entity. Um, there's a sharing of all kinds of information about food sources, danger, and so on. There's a great interdependence that somehow the birds function as if the interest of an individual bird is in the interest of the collective as a whole. And this thing has a great integrity that somehow gives the birds courage to take on a fearsome predator. Now, bear just go with me here for a bit. Imagine if we could connect ourselves on this planet through some kind of vast network of glass and air. Could we go beyond just sharing information and knowledge? Could we start to share our intelligence? Could we create some kind of collective intelligence through collaboration or some kind of consciousness? that extends beyond an individual or a team or an enterprise or a city or a society. If we could do that, we could do some wonderful things. You know, the learning organization, we never achieved it. Maybe the precondition wasn't there, consciousness. You know, maybe organizations like people that are not conscious can't learn. I mean, when I give speeches, I try and make them interesting and even funny because I find people learn more when they're conscious. During the Egyptian revolution, people said, Mubarak, he's too strong. The kids are gonna go home, they'll give up. And I wrote at the time, I don't think they will, because if they go home, he will hunt them down and he will kill them. Just like if this thing breaks up, the predators will have a field day with the individual starlings. Well, I look at this thing and I don't know, I get a lot of hope that this smaller world our kids inherit might actually be a better one. And this age of uh, networked intelligence might be an age where promise is fulfilled and where peril is unrequited. Thank you very much.